G'day, how are ya? <laughs> and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the game that I that may be spelled F-U, but it is not an F-U to, ro to role-playing, it is a foo, known as Freeform Universal, and all the way from Peril Planet, the most per the most perilous of planets, the one and only Nathan Russell. How are you doing today? I'm to good, I'm good. I have to say today instead of, to instead of tonight because goddamn time zones. <laughs> That's right. It's middle of the day where I am at the moment, so the bottom of the world, Australia. So, uh, so it so it took a bit of effort for us to meet up, but um, I'm glad we could. Well, if, well, for what it's worth, this is not my first rodeo when dealing with um, time difference all the way down there. Well, that's that's good. <laughs> yeah, I've had to do a couple of uh, interviews in different places where it's been very late nights or early mornings, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, this this is quite pleasant for me, actually. Yeah. I, so, yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, yeah. walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. Um. So good question. It was it was back in the the dark ages of my youth. Uh, so I was um, teen, probably only twelve, thirteen, and um, uh, and it was fantasy role playing games. But I sort of uh, found myself with a group of of guys that were playing, were interested in video games and that sort of thing. But they'd read a, a book about writing your own, programming your own games. And it had a reference to this other weird game called Dungeons and Dragons. And that piqued everybody's interests. And we kind of muddled our way through the description of this game, playing around and throwing dice until somebody managed to get their hands on a copy of the Red Box. And uh, from there, it was sort of uh, all systems go. We sort of, it was a, a weekly thing. We'd get together and we'd trounce through dungeons and uh, we would use. Uh, Lego pieces on on hand drawn maps to to map out our adventures and mm -hmm. and things like that, and so for quite a while that's what we we played and we graduated to AD and D uh, fairly quickly I think and then from there a whole bunch of other stuff so uh, I think in the early nineties we we played uh, Twilight two thousand and Cyberpunk twenty twenty and uh, a little bit of Warhammer Fantasy. Although we mostly we were war gaming a fair bit as well back then, so it was mostly war games for Warhammer, and yeah, and so I think we sort of just fell into it. I fell into it, and you know, at a time when I was young and impressionable, and and it sort of it stuck. I think for a long time, my parents thought that you know it would be a thing that I'd eventually grow out of and become more interested in other stuff, but no, here thirty odd years later. Still, my keen interest, my primary interest, role playing. Yeah. Now, given given the games that you mentioned, um, D and D, A D and D, um, C Cyberpunk, Twilight Two Thousand, which I'll give you props on that one. I don't I don't hear that one often. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that that was back during the during the chart hell days. <laughs> mm hmm. Um, but I know I noticed with a lot of them those are ve those are very um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say crunch heavy games because obviously when I think when I think of crunch heavy I think of the hell that is Phoenix Command which is on the list of games <laughs> I will not run unless I am getting paid <laughs> and I can gar I can guarantee not I can guarantee neither you nor anybody listening to this has the amount of mon has the amount of um, capital to pay to pay or rather bribe me into running um, Phoenix Command. <laughs> it's the same reason I won't run the the um the earlier attempt at an aliens RPG, not the not ah the, yes, not the one from um not the one from Free League. That one is actually good. I'm talking about the one from 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 almost 20 leading years edge ago. was it? Yeah. So 
Yes, I remember that. So I, I never played it, but I certainly remember it. So, Everybody um, yeah, they remembers are... it. No, but no, the and the people who have run it are are like never again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I notice is that both is that a lot of them I would consider a lot of the ones you mentioned I'd consider crunch medium to cr to crunch medium high, almost like I'm talking about steaks, <laughs> kind of kind of games, and yet. Freeform Universal is on the far and far end of the spectrum as being a very rules light, a very narrativist um, game. Where, where, what were, what was your first exposure to the idea of doing light narrativist types of um, play? Um, that's a really good question, and I, I'm just sort of racking my brain now to think about the sorts of things that. Um, that really sort of captured my intention, attention in terms of that sort of game. And, and things like um, Wuja, so I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a, a, another very light game where you would, the, the more you described your actions, the more dice you would get to add to your dice pool. Are you, are you referring to Wushu? Oh, Wushu it might be. That might be it, actually. Yes. Yeah. Much that, better. Thank you for that. That makes yes. more sense because I had never, because... I have plenty of Wuxia games, but I've never yes. heard, I've never heard of it referred heard to it that. And then when you mentioned the whole descriptiveness, I'm like, oh yeah, that's Wushu. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the name of it. Thank you for that. Um, and and certainly games like PDQ um, from Sock, Atomic Sock Monkey, I think it was. So yep. um, uh, those sorts of games sort of captured my attention in terms of uh, how. You know how much you could play around with description and and being a lot more loose and not not so much worrying about um, the statistics or the specific rules for how to make a jump or you know you know little things like that. I was more interested in what my character was doing, what my character can do, what my character's relationships with the other characters that both the players and the game master were were playing at the table and that sort of thing. And so um, so games like that certainly uh, inspired me. Uh, I played a little bit of things like Primetime Adventure and, and, and dabbled. And if I didn't get to play them, I certainly read a lot of the, the indie games from the early 2000s that mm -hmm. were, were more focused on character and character experience and that sort of thing. So my life with Master and and it's ilk yeah so yeah yeah i've 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 gone through my fair share of them um i i do remember i do remember playing a little bit of my life with master um it was it was all right but it wasn't one, it wasn't one of the ones from that time that really hooked me um, yeah I, w I will admit I, d I will admit that the possibly the greatest game <laughs> possibly the greatest indie game title that I had from that time was Kill Puppies for Satan. Oh yes. Which, <laughs> which was designed for the, which I swear was designed for the sole intended purpose of pissing people off. Yeah. Given I, I how the creator right. of that um would put would put some of the angry mail that he got that he got for just for the title on a special spot on his web on his web page, almost like a hall of shame. <laughs> um I um I do I do remember mess I do remember messing around with um with stuff like with stuff like fudge um and then er, and then early fate and the like um yep yep so I I do remember messing around with early fate I I didn't discover fudge until after fate but um but uh I don't know whether it was first or second edition fate sort of um I sort of played around with um it was back when it was still called Fantastic Adventure. You know, it had the subtitle. Yeah, Fantastic Adventures it, so. in Tabletop Entertainment. Yeah. Uh, so you know, so all of those games, I think, sort of had an influence in one way or another uh, on what I was doing. A game that I really quite like and ad admire is is Rises, um, but I I didn't discover that until. Um, until after I'd written the core of, of Freeform Universal anyway. Um, so I discovered that after, and I, it captures a lot of things that I tried to do with 
with foo and and that other games that i liked from other games and in a nice simple manner as well uh with a pool of dice when it came to when it came to the creation of um foo given given some of the uh, given some of those um early 2000s indie games that you had experienced what what were some what were some of the things you'd say you were kind of designing in reaction to cuz Art is often a response to other art. Um, I think to well, so to give a bit of the the story of of where the core rules came from, mm -hmm. I had a friend who was interested in role playing. He'd heard he knew that I was a role player. He'd heard about this thing called Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, and wanted to try it. Wanted to play something where they could play a character. They could go on an adventure. And I had decided, well, I don't want to sit down and show them, you know, a, a, the player's handbook and and all the rules that that entails and then spend however long it takes to make a character and explain that. I wanted something quick and easy that we could jump into and and I, I could take him on an adventure. And so, so that's when I sat down and I scribbled the core concepts for for freeform universal on that occasion and so i think what i was responding to was this idea that you know i need to have a whole bevy of rules that will cover any and every situation when really all i needed was a little bit of common sense on my part and some interesting description on the player's part and we could work together to tell the story that we were going to tell mm -hmm. and so i i think it was that desire to just be able to jump into a game quickly without too much forethought without too much carry on or background knowledge and, and you know so the idea that you need a 200 page rule book to to explain a game i think is probably a lot of what i was reacting to i can i can certainly uh, get that so i think so would it be would it be fair to would it be fair to say that that's that aim for simplicity is the is one of the main reasons why you went with a one d a um, singular d6 roll as your core mechanic when it comes yeah, to the whole absolutely. play the odds mechanic yeah absolutely so uh you want i wanted to keep it very very simple mm -hmm. in terms of do i succeed or not succeed and let's get on with it um and so that that basic idea of yes or no succeed or fail and move on is sort of at the core there of of why I did that. Yeah, and I'm guessing that's also the reason why instead instead of using instead of using numbers, you're using cues or descriptors for um for um character creation. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So it it becomes very easy for somebody that isn't already familiar with role-playing games it's very easy for them to describe a character with words mm -hmm. you know, tell me about your character you can ask the player a couple of questions you know do you are you, is your character well educated what's the most obvious thing people notice about you when they when they meet your character and it's very easy for somebody to describe their character or the things that they're good at uh, as opposed to learning jargon or a particular scale or metric for what good is represented you know Mm -hmm. How good is you know a twelve, you know, in this system or that sort of thing. So, the the idea of using words and and descriptive phrases and lots of other games do it too. To you know, for exactly those reasons, I think that you know a nice description is very easy for players, everybody at the table to latch onto and and understand what's you know embedded in those ideas or in those words. Yeah, and. Given, given the, given that, and the fact that, obvious, obviously, any default role is going to have a fifty-fifty shot. This brings me to the um, positive and negative <clears throat> modifiers and how and how you handle it, since the approach yeah. that you're doing is that is that each of these will add a d, add a um, d six to the role. And depending on how many positives or modifiers you'd take, the highest or or the lowest um, result. What I'm curious yeah. about is in 
in er, in play t in early playtests, did you did you ever run into an instance of the dice getting um, swingy? So, um, yeah, it's naturally pretty swingy. Once you get beyond three mm -hmm. dice, it's it's pretty swingy. Um, so it's if you're rolling three bonus dice, then you're going to succeed more more than likely. Um, and so then it comes down to exactly how well you you succeed because you're still not because the basic mechanic there is that a six is yes and so it's a, a success with a bonus of some kind so even though when you're rolling multiple bonus dice you're you're more than likely going to succeed it's a matter of how well you succeed because you've still got a chance of an awesome success or essentially a, a partial success so it then comes down to that more uh you know specific how well did i do that thing so so you're right it is it is quite sing swingy um mm -hmm. and um and if you're then rolling huge numbers of dice five six dice uh then it then it becomes a sure thing and at that point it's probably worthwhile even you know asking whether you need to roll the dice at all yeah and so Given that, would you would you say would you say that um that you'd pro you'd probably you'd probably advise people to ca to cap any um any roll as to be no higher than three d six. Yeah, I think using the the rules as written um, now after you know ten more years of play and and feedback and that sort of thing, I I think that capping the dice is a a good option or or even just stopping and thinking well if i'm rolling if i if the odds are so much in my favor if i'm rolling six dice and i'm going to take the highest of those dice then maybe there isn't actually a need to roll at all and we just move the story forward and and uh and take it from there would be probably my thoughts on it these days um and certainly uh yeah you know, i've certainly that's the way that i would be playing it um you know, today yes um now given now this has been now obviously fu has been has been out in the wild for quite for quite a few years yeah i had for i had for i personally at first discovered it when it was shown on um a on a site i used to frequent called well the free rpg blog that's how I also found out about okay, Jax yeah. and a f and a few other weird pro a few other weird projects at the time. Um, yep. Oh, there was that, and of course, one KM, one KT. If you don't mind me dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine because so the free RPG site, um, so run by Rob Lang and and then um, the forum one KM, one KT. Um, so they were running so they were running lots or regular uh 24 hour role playing game design jams design contests oh, I, remember, I remember those called jams yeah and so that's where the foo rules that are available now that's where that version came from so that came from a 24 hour role playing jam mm -hmm. Um, and so I had the core rules already that I'd played with, with my friends that I'd used, that I'd written to introduce them to role playing and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, Yeah, um, but yeah, that's why that's there. That's why that's fake. Um, was featured there. Yeah, um, but when when you had first 
when you had first started putting it out into the wild, were were there any um were there any common motifs when it came to feedback or any um learning experiences that you t that you took away from from the from the the years of testing it? Yeah, for sure. So, um, and I and I didn't realize. I you know it's a, I I th I put it together and and put it out there for the the world to to see and and play with and and then over the years so it was it was 2010 i think that that went out and um and so over the years we've had lots and lots of really positive interactions with people and providing offering feedback and providing suggestions and and playing around with it and writing their own hacks and variations of the rules uh and and that core dice mechanic has been at the center of a lot of changes or adjustments um to a lot of people's hacks um so there was for a time a lot of people were using a variant that was inspired by um the game's hot war and mm -hmm. cold city um, which is a dice pool of um of would they use d10s in that game but uh, the variations that i saw used either d10s or d6s and then had a, a sliding scale a little bit like the ladder from from fate that would help you determine your your final outcome um but over time i fell into using an alternative system uh that's featured in neon city overdrive and that is in a um a beta set of second edition rules for foo um that that rolls all your advantage and penalty dice together and then does some cancelling out at the table instead and um it adds a little bit more randomness to the role and so that's sort of where i've ended up preferring to uh to go with my dice rolls there uh, all right okay i can get that and um now this now Obviously, I've um, I've seen I've seen a few I've seen a few attempts to do uh, like I see with a lot of universal games, do genre hacks of um, of foo. Um, yeah. In fact, the th the three prominent ones that I have that I have in my archives are, um, well, the big the biggest one was somebody trying to hack to hack um Earth Dawn into foo. Yep. Which, and a couple smaller ones doing the Matrix and doing um, Star Wars. Yeah. And so, uh, oh yeah, keep going. Sorry. What I'm the first. What I'm curious about is when it comes to do, when it comes to doing um genre hacks, especially genre hacks of of more de of more detailed um, settings or systems. Um. What what's the what's the kind of um, do's and don'ts that you usually advise people? When they're ha when they're hacking it to um to bring in characters or settings from more complex games, um so good question. Uh, my preference is to do as little as possible, and and that's why for t for ten years I so I wrote the the Matrix and the the Star yeah. Wars packs yep. and um and I did those early on sort of just for my own benefit and. You know, for my own group of players, we mucked around and played. You know, in you know brief one shots and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, I, I, my personal preference is to to add as little as possible, because the the core rules um, cover a fair bit of ground as it is. So your your character is made up with four descriptors. So describe your body, your mind, an edge, and a floor. And they can cover a huge variety of uh, skills and genre tropes and and that sort of thing. Um, what I did find when I was writing those hacks, though, were that it did help to clarify uh, some areas that I've later feel like I've improved on. So I introduced the idea of concepts in the in the Star Wars hack, mm -hmm. um, and so that became like an edge, so a descriptor that was much broader that that would add dice to your, your dice pool and um, for a whole variety of things as opposed to an edge, which was a very specific skill that would add dice to your dice rolls. Um, the uh, Earth Dawn 
uh, game, so Earth Dawn Legends, that was put out uh, by Vagrant Studios. Um, it still used that core, and they, but they had a particular goal that they wanted to capture um, key features of the Earth, the original Earth Dawn game and Earth Dawn setting, and so they added a whole additional element of um, I can't remember what they call them now. They're talents or special abilities, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but they. I, I believe it's been a while since I've read the book, actually, but I believe that it still used the same core concept that the talent would allow you to do something or give you an opportunity to make a dice roll. So they became sort of permissions. So if I have this talent, I have permission to do something, narrative permission to do something in the in the game. So I have narrative permission to attempt something that another character couldn't otherwise attempt or to use a particular kind of magic that other characters can't use or that sort of thing. And, and I quite like that idea of using your descriptors, the tags or aspects in Fate, using your descriptors to give you narrative permission to try something in the game. I quite like that idea, yeah. and, and I'd play around with that if I was hacking the game for mm. other settings. And that that's... Given, given, that, given that kind of thing... Um, I w when it comes to hacking, I do want to pick your brain on that, since obviously when you're dealing with a universal style game, you're um, and I often I often tell my students this: don't look to not look at a universal game as a game in and of itself, but look at it as like a programming language, or the or yeah. the or the blue bucket of Legos that we all had as kids. Unless you unless you were unfortunate enough unless you were unfortunate enough to get stuck with Mega Blocks or Salt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's an excellent description to to use it like a programming language or to use it as a building block for building blocks for yeah. for your own goal. And so, it, so, th yeah, that's a great analogy. So I do want to go going on the whole pick going on the whole do's and don'ts when it comes to hacks. I am cur I am curious on your on your take on a few. Um, on a few con on a few concepts that are s that that I that I've that I see bandied about and how you'd have something like Foo handle them. Um, okay. Now th I've got now, given the fact that I've got I've got a um I've got a fair few people in my temple who lo who love them who love themselves a good Shaw Brothers movie. Um, yep. How would how would you hand how would you handle um how would you handle a hack that would that would lean more towards um a martial arts film with with different characters expressing different um fighting styles um so i my um first thought with sort of a game that was going to lean into fighting styles would be to maybe have your edges so you'd have some descriptors Mm -hmm. that indicate the specific things that your character is good at. So maybe make them quite narrow in their focus. So you might have a few descriptors that, that convey the broad details of your character about whether it's their appearance or their background or, or whatever, and then a subset of very specific edges that that indicate that they're good at grappling or they're good at flying kicks or... Or that sort of thing, and then that way in play, you you make the assumption because of the genre that we're playing in, everyone's good at fighting. So we've got that baseline, and then when my character does something that they've got an edge in, well, they're actually you know quite good at that particular thing, whether it's throws or blocking or you know leaping from tall building, you know leaping from heights down onto my target or or that sort of thing. That would be my first sort of gut instinct in terms of how I would play around with that in a hack. I get, um, I, I can definitely get that, and I, I could easily see, I could easily see a similar approach handled when it comes to, um, when it comes since I brought up Star Wars earlier, um, lightsabered fighting styles. Since, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, since up, uh, since. 
just ha just have just having the having some having the uh, having a generic saber fighting style doesn't um does doesn't go doesn't go far enough in my opinion um especially since fighting style can be used to infer um characterization Yep, absolutely. And so then you could sort of narrow it down into um, in, into tricks, basically, that we see in the movies as well, you know, things like deflecting blaster shots and, and stuff like that. You could make your character quite adept at specific things that we see yeah. in the films. Um, um, the although, although in those kind of situations, when it comes to duels, I'd probably have to really hack the holy hell out of um out of the extra effort that is foo points and yes, turn, the, yeah. turn that into kind of a kind of a um stamina bid yeah you know, i you... i think that that would be a good move foo um works really nicely for for quick combats so for uh, to engage with an enemy deal with them move on uh but for extended battles uh, it can sometimes feel like it drags a little bit if there's a lot of toing and froing, uh, because there's no, th there's really no hit points in in food. When you when you get hit, you're going to suffer a consequence that's represented as a an injury that's ticked or written down on your sheet or that sort of thing. So, uh, so what you might do then is use your foo points, uh, which are like fate points, drama points. Mm -hmm. Uh, you might use those either as a form of yeah, endurance or as a way to unlock special abilities. So spend your food point to do something cool. Um, yeah, so there's a few ways you might play around with that. Yeah. And give um, the other the other one the other one that I'd, that I'm considering is um, is how you'd handle magic systems. And yeah. I'll st I'll start with the I'll start with the obvious. How if somebody was in if somebody was integrating a character that used the um Vancian st style of magic, you know, spe you know, spell charges, the kind of the kind of spells per day thing that we see in D&D, &D, although oddly enough not from Jack Vance himself. But, <laughs> oh. Um but, yeah. But how but how would you handle that kind of approach? So this this has come up so I, I've played around with a few options and and different people have had different opinions on how successful that was. Um, my first so my first always default answer is that if somebody wants to have a magic power, just make it one of your descriptors and and move on. So one player might be the barbarian fighter and I'll have a descriptor that says barbarian and another descriptor that says hit things really hard with my sword. Mm -hmm. And and then the second player might have their descriptors as being wizard and magical bolts. And and then the easy option is to just play forward from there and um and my bar barbarian can do all the cool stuff that a barbarian can do and my wizard can do all the cool stuff that a wizard can do and I get an extra dice to roll if I'm chucking magic bolts at something. Um, but for something more specific, particularly if you want a character that that has powers that most people don't have, so a setting where you've got, I don't know, a bunch of investigators, X-Files type investigators, you know, researching the supernatural and the bizarre, but one character wants to have psychic powers. Um, in that case... I would probably just require the spending of a foo point to use that ability. Have it written on the sheet, just like any of the other descriptors. But in order to use that ability, spend a foo point, and then that way they've got to make a choice about whether they really want to, uh, whether they really want to use that ability or, and use up their resource of the foo point or not. Uh, so yeah, that and that's where. I Speaking of um, speaking of foo points, alternative. Yep. Um, I given the given the fact that distribution and use of foo points is for starters the game what I've referred to as the game's extra effort system, because yep. 
a lot of a lot of indie a lot of indie RPGs and some non indie RPGs have this. Um, how what's the do's and don'ts that you have to make sure that food to make sure that food points aren't distributed too liberally? Because since it's one of those GM discretion kind of things, I could easily see it um, becoming a Monty Hall situation. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think the toughest part is because uh, there's potentially lots of reasons to give players and characters foo points uh, to to spend. And so the key I find, the challenge I sometimes find is getting encouraging players to spend those points. And so, um, so my personal preference in play is to to encourage players to give them lots of opportunities suggest when they might use foo points hmm. and then and then once they do spend some foo points very quickly find a new opportunity to give them back to them and so what i try to um, provoke in play is this cycle of foo points just constantly getting spent and then being given back as a a little bit of a reward for um, for doing cool stuff with your characters, and then that way, um, and then that way, when you want to add some extra tension in the game, then you can slow down the return of foo points. Mm -hmm. You can add some pressure, and and then suddenly it becomes an important resource again. And then when you get over that hump of that tension, fall back again into, all right, I'm going to give you another foo point. Here's your food point, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, in more recent iterations of rules that I've done inspired by Foo, um, I've made it, I, I've made the return of food points uh, as a requirement. Sorry, I'm getting confused. As a way you earn your food points by bringing your flaws into play. Mm -hmm. So, um, so now what it does is it encourages players to take a particular kind of action in order to refresh their pool of points. And uh, and then that gives players a reason to bring their, their drawbacks and their, their troubles into play um, without the game master having to really work super hard to hook those, those troubles and flaws into a scene. You'll find that players go, oh, this might be an opportunity for my character's smart mouth to come into play. And yeah, I um, I could also easily I could also easily see it where, so where somebody um, where a foo, a foo point is a, a foo point could be awarded if they happen to roll on the lo on the low end of the odds, like if they roll if they roll like a one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, and yeah, have, that have that kind of thing, but have that. Kind much like the whole light and dark side points in Star Wars FFG, have that kind of thing go both ways. Yeah, you know, yep. and takes the sort of sting. You're, you're about to fail miserably, but here's a here's a point that you can use to dig yourself out of that situation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, of course, another possibility is ha is having it that there's a um, there's al there's always a set a set number of um, foo points and gaining gaining. Gaining, um, using one means that the GM gets one, and if the GM uses one, then the then the players get one. Player gets one. Yep, absolutely. Oh. So yeah, and I think that you can play around with the way those points, those food points, are distributed and 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 shared around the table, to in order to adjust the tone of the game or the genre of the game, uh, in, in that way. So in a, a game that is way over the top and and full of crazy hijinks you may not worry too much about gaming background
around. And that's not that's yeah. not me slagging in what some, what somebody had played in the past. It's just that certain games creates can create certain habits or assumptions. Yep. And yep, absolutely. And in, in the worst cases, you have somebody while well, well, trying to crochet with boxing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> but, which, for the record, don't do that. If you do that, I take no responsibility for what happens. But, Someone losing an eye. <laughs> again, I take no responsibility for what happened. <laughs> but I'm, cur I'm curious if, there's, if you've had in the instances of people having to unlearn certain habits when they come into... Um, they come into a game that's more crunchy than foo, and then jump and then jump into um, foo. Yeah, I think combat is the big one um, because foo is to it, it doesn't have the trappings that uh, crunchier games tend to have. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't have hit points. It it does talk about scenes and turns and and says use turns when you really need to know what people are doing but uh it's it it will break down fairly quickly if you if you put the characters in a room with a with a half dozen mooks or goblins or whatever and and try to have a slog fest you know taking in turns to hit each other and wear each other down mm -hmm. so it's much better off thinking of it like a movie or a you know, a scene from a film where you have the characters jump in, they describe their actions, the game master describes what the opponents are doing. You then gather your pool of, of dice, work out whether you've got a net bonus or penalty dice, and, and roll to see what the resolution is. And and maybe the resolution is you wipe out the room full of, of enemy. Maybe the resolution is, oh, you take out a few, but there's still a few there and they've taken up better positions. And you think about it and, and work together at the table to tell the story of what's happening there rather than as a tactical combat that you might do in another game. Given that, would you would you say that um, one of that one of the more common one of the more common types of um, types of role playing conceits that being stuff like the hex crawl or the dungeon crawl would require would, um, that would encompass the attacks from the air. Enemy, the attacks from the the character and that sort of thing. So you might you want to give opportunities for for doing all the other things, you know, like searching and interacting with characters and and interesting NPCs and bits of investigation or problems to overcome, whether it's physical problems or or puzzles or I think you'd you'd want to make sure that there's a broad variety of activities to do mm -hmm. to run your your dungeon crawler because you couldn't you couldn't have an evening that was just two fights and search the room kind of thing that yeah. that would take you 10 minutes of play yeah given the given the um given the fact that if that a, st a standard die roll is that is that 50 50 um shot um what's your advice when it comes to handling um contested rules where where okay. you're not you're not really it's not really um it's it's more it's more about contesting against someone else directly instead of versus the general environment. Yeah. So what you would do is you factor in uh, all the things that are in your characters. So because the 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 first thing is that only the players roll. So the the game master doesn't make dice rolls. Mm -hmm. So the player would start by factoring in all the stuff that's in their advantage. So they'd go, oh. I'm an expert, let's take combat for instance, a, yeah. a one roll combat. I'm an expert swordsman, so I'm going to factor in a bonus die. Uh, and I've, of course I've got the higher ground, so I've got an environmental advantage, so I'm going to factor that in. Uh, and um, my enemy's already wounded for some reason. My, I've, I've encountered them and I've managed to sneak up on the wounded monster, so I'm going to add another bonus die to factor in the fact that my opponent is already a bit injured 
Mm-hmm. So I've got three bonus dice there. And then what I would do is I'd factor in all the stuff that that is in my opponent's advantage. So all the things that are helping my opponent would become penalty dice. So my opponent is uh, immensely strong. So there's a penalty die. Mm-hmm. And my opponent has multiple arms. So there's another penalty die. And my opponent... Um, I don't breathes fire for whatever reason. I'm going to factor that in as another penalty die because I've got to watch out for that fire breath while I'm fighting him. Mm-hmm. And so, and then in the basic food rules, my bonus die. I compare my bonus and penalty dice. The penalty dice cancel out the bonus die, and I see what I've got left. In this case, I think I've I've got a net zero, so I'm back to one die mm-hmm. to roll. Um, but that's what I do. I just anything that works for the opponent is factored in as a penalty die. Anything that works for my character is factored in as a bonus die, and then I do my calculation there. Yeah. Um, I will admit, because of the fact that I have a bunch of black and white die, instead instead of doing the whole roll highest, there's been a few times where I've just rolled every po- every um, positive as a white die and every negative as a black die. And, yep. And just, and just, compare, just compare the highest of both. Um, yep, yep. So- so that's very close. So there is a a playtest version of a second edition rules for Foo um, on the Peril Planet website, and that is very close to the dice system in there. So um, it doesn't use the classic um, the classic system where you're actually doing your modifiers before you roll, and so you roll two you roll a pool of dice of two different colors. Mm-hmm. One of the dice are your action dice your good dice and the other dice are your danger dice your bad dice Mm -hmm. and and then in that in this iteration of the rules the danger dice cancel out a matching action die so a five on a danger die would cancel out a five on on your good die you just remove those from the pool entirely there's a you roll the pool and cancel out yeah so, um yeah. now speak now speaking of me- of messing about with the rules now I'll, I'll i'll get to i'll get to the whole second edition thing in a, in a moment but there's yep. one but one thing i did want to dive into a bit is the is the cyberpunk hack that you have for foo called neon city overdrive yep and uh Yep, now, so. ob- obviously, I am no stranger when it comes when it comes to cyberpunk, but there's a, cu- a couple things that I'm curious about. One is what your int- what your introduction to um, cyberpunk was, because everybody has the- their particular, um, for lack of a better term, gateway drug into yeah. <laughs> into the gen- into the genre, and when when you when you had decide when you had finally decided to do neon city overdrive what were some what were some of the things you looked at with fu and and thought that these were going to have to be either re, either reworked or rebuilt okay okay yeah so um well my introduction the the thing that really hooked me was um blade runner um and and that was at a really early age mm-hmm. i i didn't see blade runner when it came out um, but, but I remember seeing posters and, and ads for it and it really captured my attention. I have a very distinct memory as a kid of desperately wanting to see this cool science fiction movie. And then, and then very distinctly remembering the day that we were able to get a copy of it on VHS tape and bring it home. And, and I was finally able to watch this movie and it, I think it's stuck with me ever since. And it's been, you know, as I think for a lot of people, you know, one of those moments that really defined their, their appreciation of the cyberpunk genre. Mm -hmm. And then that led me to Gibson's work and, um, and his cyberpunk novels and that sort of thing. So in terms of genre, they were the the big influences on me. Yeah. And then that led to the role-playing side of it and cyberpunk and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when it came to writing, Neon City Overdrive, 
um, it was an interesting roundabout. I'd I'd written the draft of the second edition Foo Rules, and I got stuck. I got really stuck because the the second edition rules are there is a lot in them. It's it's over a hundred odd pages, and and the original, the core Foo Rules are, are twenty four pages, including an adventure. They're they're sixteen pages, I think, all up with actual rules. Mm. Um, and so, and I just it it niggled at me that the rules had ballooned out to more than a hundred odd pages, one hundred and thirty pages or something. Um, and it niggled at me that it felt that it had lost some of its succinctness and and you know clarity of purpose. Um, and so, what I did was I took bits from the second edition and that I really liked, stuff that I I really wanted to play around with and 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 I just used those bits and left the rest of the second edition stuff on the cutting room floor kind of. Mm-hmm. So I, I took the dice mechanic that I really wanted. I took bits of the stuff that I'd written about combat in the second edition rules. I took bits of that and then reworked it um, and, and played with it from there. I took um, the idea of edges and descriptors and and then added to it. So something that I'd been re- writing about for a long time was a thing called trademarks, which was an edge with sub skills or specializations attached to it. Around or went off and did something else. So, um, so I've made hacking. Uh, I, I've made the internet, the grid, mm-hmm. accessible to everybody. So everybody can use the grid in one form or another. It's just that a dedicated hacker or code slinger is going to be far superior at doing stuff in the grid. Um, and then in play, I just treat the grid as. Uh, another place to visit so just like you might go to the corp headquarters in meat space you can jack into the grid and and you can go to places in the grid either as an individual or as a group or that sort of thing so i wanted to keep it super simple uh in that regard um in the supplement that i wrote for it the grid i sort of give some guidelines on what the basic look of the grid is it's neon um, wire frames most of the time and then when there's enough interest you know people will code super realistic stuff inside the grid Uh, but characters can jack in either using headsets or actual um, actual literally jacking in or or there's a few different options and then they can interact with the the grid in that way and so that way the whole party can get in there if they want if only one character is really good and the rest of the party don't want to risk themselves in the grid they can do a thing called piggybacking Mm -hmm. which is kind of like they just follow the hacker around inside his head and can see what they see Um, but i was trying to keep it simple in terms of what would i want to experience as both a game master and a player at the table when when characters were grid running all right i I can definitely get that, especially since doing this kind of um, addresses the addresses the a problem that's very common with hacking systems, even hacking systems that I like, which is yeah. you're having one person doing all the work while everybody else is just sitting on their thumbs. 
Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so theoretically, your character, all your characters, can enter the grid, and and they can have specializations depending on the trademarks, the particular backgrounds that they picked for their characters. You you could have a character that is an expert. Carry over into other people's. <laughs> Cyberpunk That's exactly experiences because right. everybody because everybody doing cyberpunk is a fucking weeb, <laughs> and that includes myself. I'm not too proud to admit but it. Straight samurai. <laughs> so, Look, con yes. Confession is good um, for the soul, even even for yes. gingers. <laughs> um, uh, yes. But getting to um, getting to the matter of second edition. Yep. Um Now when 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 it came to do when it came to doing a second edition was the what was the impetus for it? Was it a case of needing to start fresh, needing to needing to refine things? How did how did it come about? Um it came about because I had written a whole bunch of articles about how to play how to play around and with with the foo rules and mm -hmm. and a, a lot of the articles were kind of me going through the design process in my head at times you know here's an idea i have here's what i would do with it that sort of thing uh and so there was this accumulation of origins it's
Hey, you there? I am so sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Discord derped on me. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. These yeah. things happen. Yeah. Um. Eh. So I'm not sure how much got lost. I was starting to waffle anyway. So. Um. <laughs> um, you just mentioned that it be that it had become a bit uh, become a bit um of a big that Neon City Overdrive had become a bit um bigger. Yeah, oh yeah, second edition had come up much yeah. bigger than mm -hmm. than the original and um so yeah. And so it's out there. It's got all these ideas from 10 years worth of writing yeah. and thinking and scribbled notes and um uh, for people to have a bit of a look at and I'm I'm kind of trawling through it for the bits that I really love and the bits that probably need to just go away at the moment. So but that's why it's a beta and it's out there for free for people to yeah. muck in, around with. In that regard, do you consider do you consider this do you consider this to lean more in the realm of a full on second edition or more like a director's cut? Um yeah, I think that I think that it's definitely a second edition because there's some significant changes um for, from the original. Um and to the point where I, I do consider them you know, the the original game and the second edition quite different in terms of um in in terms of what they're doing so not just the dice mechanic but um uh there's a bit more meat on the bones of the second edition the, the original rules don't have uh advancement or experience rules or things like that for instance mm -hmm. so so the second edition tackles that stuff um the second edition has a fair chunk of advice i will say on running combats mm -hmm. um but that's one of the things i'm working through at the moment about i, I it's going to get a serious re-edit i think the the combat rules and the damage rules because uh it's not working the way i would i really want it to work um so uh so yeah but it, it's certainly a second edition as opposed to a director's a cut so yeah yeah um and in that re in that regard, has um, have has anybody had even though I, even though obviously it's still going with D sixes, has anybody ever um, tooled with the idea of using using a different type of die for resolution? Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly have. I think there's um, a bit of a suggestion floating around on the Freeform Universal site uh, for using a a d20 uh and so that just works where you each thing that works in your favor is a plus one modifier and each thing that's against you know working against you is a minus one modifier and you roll the d20 add apply your modifiers and compare your result to a chart basically uh and some people really liked the simplicity of that single dice roll i think they'd like the familiarity of a d20 and and modifiers um I also at one point wrote uh, a set of uh, rules that use um, your full set of, or that could potentially use your full set of polyhedrals. Mm. Um, so what it relied on was um, how many of your bonus dice rolled higher than your penalty dice. And so the more, the more good dice rolls you had compared to bad dice rolls, gave you whether it was a, a yes end or a yes but kind of result um, and then that allowed you to use all the different funky dice if you really wanted to uh, mm -hmm. to represent exceptional skills or abilities I never finished it but I will ad I will admit that at one point I had tooled around with the idea of replacing the d6 roll with a um, with a 52 card deck nice um, nice the the only thing that I, the only thing that, sh that I changed with it is just get is just getting rid of the um getting rid of all the face cards um okay yep the the um the approach the approach being that ev every um every factor whether positive or negative um adds adds one card the D the dm doesn't draw any cards from doesn't play any cards for himself he draw so let's say you let's say you've got Let's say you've got a um, got a contest that's doing some good old jousting because I missed the Ren Fair, damn it. 
Um, <laughs> so you've got you've you've got your armor cleaned up, so that's a positive. Um, you've got some. Your opponent has a bigger has a has a larger horse than you, a war horse instead of a instead of a um instead of a traveling horse. So that's a minus against you. Um, you're you've already you've already been in one match. So your armor's got some got some dings. So that's another minus. But instead of having those be um be pluses and minuses, it would just be three cards that would be put on the table, and you've got to pick one of them. Um, obviously, okay, yeah. still doing the whole odds and evens. But the twist that I did is that. The suit determines whether there's an and or a but. So yeah, that's really good. Yeah. If you get if you get above if you if you get above if you get above high and it's a and it's a red suit, then it's an and. If you get if you if you draw low and it's a um if, you, if a a and is a, a red suit, and a but is any um black suit. Because I, yep, I wanted yep. something that could be both horizontal and vertical when it yep. came to results. Because at the time at the time I at the time I was messing around with the one roll engine, and I like the horizontal and vertical roller height and height and width as it, as it calls it. Yeah. So I was kind of messing around with that. I um was never able to finish it because I couldn't get things balanced exactly the way I wanted. But I was. I'm always no. a sucker for introducing card mechanics into RPGs. Yeah. So there's. Uh, it's a, a really neat idea. So yeah, I, I like the idea of cards in, in mechanics. So uh, I only played a little bit of Castle Falkenstein and a little bit of Versus Monsters, but um, you know those sort of card mechanics are great. I w when it came to introducing card mechanics in RPGs, I cut my teeth on the two um so in the two saga system books that TSR put out in the 90s. Oh yeah, yep. I um, remember those. I think I only ever played it once, but I do remember them. Um Dragonlance 5th Age and um and Marvel, Marvel and Marvel Adventure. Yep, yep. Which... So yeah, I played I I played the Dragonlance one. So uh yes, I, I would have liked to have played a lot more actually. So they were neat little games. I um, I'm in the minority with it, but I actually prefer the I actually prefer the Dragonlance one since the um, the Marvel one I f I felt played things a little bit too loosely. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But e especially when it especially when it comes to um, powers, you need you. I think I think when it comes to doing a supers game, you need to have some specificity because of how wild and and personalized powers can get. Yep. Um, now, given given all of, given all of that, um, now currently the currently the second edition is in beta. But what what do you work What are you currently working on that you that you're planning on putting out in the in the coming months? Uh, so I'm currently uh, I'm plotting away at a, another set of rules. Uh, sorry, another game that uses the same set of rules from Neon City Overdrive mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, supernatural, modern supernatural games in the style of uh, the TV show Supernatural or Lucifer or, or those sorts of uh, TV shows. So you can play uh, monster hunters and supernatural creatures and things like that. It's well-trodden, you know, fair for role-playing games but i uh, i started it while i was binging the supernatural show and so i was inspired and i think i'd just seen um something on netflix warrior nun i think on netflix what it was so uh you know they sort of sparked all these ideas in in my imagination so i'm working on that slowly at the moment and then i'm also just doing a bunch of behind the scenes things because uh some files and for some of my products that are already out, need updating and fixing up and and things. So drive through RPG of um, just switched to removing all the saddle stitched books. So uh, the two of the supplements for Neon City Overdrive uh, are currently unavailable in print on demand because the files have got to be updated and things like that. So 
Uh, got a bunch of behind the scenes things happening at the moment as well as working on that supernatural game. All right. Well, I will I will certainly look forward to seeing how that how that particularly develops in the, as mm -hmm. the as the months go on. And in lo in lo in lieu of in lieu of making sure that I don't jinx, um, as they say, <laughs> break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but I I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity, even if it meant going through time zone hell in the process. <laughs> no, I really appreciate. It. I've really really enjoyed. So thanks very much for inviting me on. Uh, it's been a while since we had a, a good chat about Freeform Universal, actually. So, uh, so I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Well, ideally, this won't be the last time you ha you have a chat about Freeform Universal here in the temple. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And so, as I often say, um, drinking is not mandatory here in the temple, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Well then, I'll be sure when it's when it's a certain time in my time to, to have a good drink. Yeah. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>